So we'll take a look real quickly at uh, an area of psychology that's called psychophysics, and it basically looks at how sensation and perception um, are interrelated and how uh, the body processes physical stimulation and then what its psychological effects are. So um, it's psychophysics is the study of how these physical stimuli are translated into our psychological experience. Um, so that is how do we take sensation and sensation is stimulus of sense organs. So smelling something, hearing something, seeing something, feeling something, tasting something, any of those sensations, um, any of those stimuli, then how do we perceive that? So how do we recognize the information? How do we interpret it? And then how do we organize that in our brains? Um, and that is our perception of these sensations. And that's an important factor. And that's what um, we're going to take a look at and, and kind of seeing these different things. So that's psychophysics. Uh, and one of the big things that we're, we'll look at as we, as we study this whole sensation and perception is uh, what we call thresholds. And thresholds can be divided generally into two, two different categories. And there's, there's really some overlap between them. They're not necessarily uh, distinct um, categories. Uh, but the two categories are detection thresholds and discrimination thresholds. And so first we'll look at dis detection thresholds. Um, and detection thresholds are the mark and the moment at which you, you sense a stimulus. Um, so a detection threshold is what is the smallest amount of something, sound, pressure, taste, uh, smell, noise, uh, that an individual can detect. What is the smallest amount that we can detect and recognize? Uh, and this helps us determine something that we call the absolute threshold. And the absolute threshold is that minimal amount of stimulation um, needed to detect stimulus. And then the key here is that um, kind of everyone's a little bit different and every interaction's a little bit different. So the, the absolute threshold is the amount of stimulation that's required to fire our neurons 50% of the time. And that's where we get um, the absolute threshold value. And there's a really good chart in your, in your textbook that shows that it's not an exact uh, moment because different perceptions from different people. So we just figure what is the sound, what is the level of touch that causes our neurons to fire half the time, and that is what we determine our... Um, absolute threshold. So an example of how we find this is an experimenter would play um, a number of sounds or tones at varying volumes to determine at exactly what point can a participant say that they heard the tone. Um, and so that is um, that is how we determine the absolute threshold. Um, and another, another way to determine uh, detection threshold, that is what point do we uh, hear something or see something or, or feel something, is through what we call signal detection theory. Um, and in a detection experiment with, that is run, there are essentially four outcomes. There are two variables. Uh, the stimulus, it's either there or it isn't. And then uh, the response of the participant, either they say yes or no. That is like, I see it, feel it, hear it, touch it, or I don't see it, feel it, hear it, or touch it. Um, and so there are four then potential outcomes. And that's really displayed well on a chart over here, I think. Um, so there's either the hit, which is the signal is present, and the participant reports sensing it. So again, using this example from before of the tone, right? Like, there is a sound and I heard it, so yes, that is a hit. There is a miss, that is the signal is present, but I did not sense it. I did not hear it. So there was a sound, but I did not hear it, so I did not report hearing it, therefore that is a miss. Then there's a false alarm, which is when the signal is not there. There is no sound, but I said, oh, yes, I heard something. Um, and that's, a, that's bad as well. Uh, and then there's a correct rejection. That is, there is no sound, and I say, I did not hear anything. Uh, and so those are the four possible outcomes. And when we put someone through these experiments, um, using that data that we can collect based off these things, we can tell at what volume can someone hear something, at what uh, pressure can someone feel something, at what uh, light level can someone see something. And so this is all very important for us as we try to determine um, detection threshold as we move forward. 
Um, the other thing that there is is what we call discrimination threshold. And discrimination threshold uh, is the ability to distinguish between two stimuli. So uh, the discrimination threshold is what's the minimum amount of distance is what term that is often used in psychology uh, between two stimuli um, that can be detected. So uh, like what what is the difference in pressure uh, before you notice it uh, if someone's pressing on your hand? What is the difference in volume between two sounds before you notice it? Or what is the difference in two tastes before you notice it? Um, and so these are the types of things uh, that, that we look for in discrimination threshold, right? What is the amount of difference between two, two different stimuli before we can actually uh, notice it? And so again, here's this example, expert playing two tones at varying volumes, and then they, the participants would try to determine, is that the same tone or is it a different one? And uh, the volume at which they can tell there a difference um, is what we would call the discrimination threshold, the recognition that that is somehow different. And then the last thing we'll look at today is what we call um, subliminal perception, and that is um, how do we have subliminal messaging, essentially. Um, and so it's subliminal perception is a, is a form of pre-conscious processing. Um, that is that we, are, we experience the stimulus so rapidly that we don't even recognize that it's happening. So it's like happening in milliseconds or less than milliseconds and information is just flashing in front of us or we're hearing it in blips but we're not actually um, fully aware of it um, but then when we are later presented with that same stimuli for a longer period of time uh, we're able to more quickly recognize those than uh, any other stimulus that we were not exposed to so for example if we saw a picture of a certain brand like coca-cola and it was flashed before our eyes as we were watching uh, some unrelated commercial uh, and it was done at such a rapid pace that we didn't consciously process it uh, but we subconsciously processed it then when we were later asked oh what would you like to drink we would perhaps be more likely because of the subliminal idea of coca-cola uh, to select a coca-cola over say a pepsi or a sprite or a root beer because we'd been presented with that subconscious and so this subliminal perception is kind of trippy. It makes people kind of a little weirded out with concern that uh, people can control your mind or whatever it may be. And that's not really the case. Um, it's not really super effective. They don't notice much of a difference. And it has to be very concentrated. You have to be paying kind of really close attention to it in order to, um, to even notice much of a difference. So uh, it's not something you need to worry about, but it is something interesting theoretically for us to deal with and to try and figure out uh, how our subconscious experience uh, may actually affect our conscious choices. So that's the beginning of understanding sensation and perception and dealing with thresholds and then uh, subliminal perception.